Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Friday is one of our best days because we do Ask and Answered with our friends from Fundraising Academy. And today we have the beautiful LaShonda Williams, MPA, CFRE, joining us, representing a different sector of the nonprofit uh, world, coming to us directly from Houston and bringing all of her wisdom and insight to us today. No pressure, my friend. No pressure. <laughs> we are poised for a great conversation today. We are. I always love what you have to say. And I think it's it's really cool to have you on. So I appreciate you very, very much. Just like I appreciate all of our sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. Another really exciting thing that's going on, and you might have noticed it, is that we're, we've really expanded our co-hosting panel. We have about eight people, I'm, I include myself, LaShonda, that come and join us from all over the country. And you're going to be seeing more and more of them as we roll them out over the next several weeks. Okay, you know how I love when we have to take off somebody's name or their city. Very, very interesting. I've got it. I, I can't wait. I can't wait to hear your answer on this. Shannon writes, I have a wealthy couple who wants to become more involved with our nonprofit. They have requested a tour of our campus and program. The wife has given me some dates. Should I push to have them both be together on the tour? That is a great question, okay? And I'm thinking about the phrases that were used. They have they want to become involved. And that means that there's interest from both of them. Okay. And the ideal setting would be to have both of them visit together. Because as you are nurturing the relationship with those prospective donors, because they're all prospective donors, whether it's upgrade giving or their initial gift, uh, you want to make sure that both people are involved and have those specific experiences. Because should they have a dynamic time at the end of that tour and you're feeling very comfortable because they're giving you all the indicators that they don't want to wait to make a gift. They want to make a gift right now. You want to make sure that you have both people that are involved in that decision-making process. Okay. And unless they specifically say, well, no, go ahead and, and facilitate the tour with my wife because she's really excited, I'm not able to attend, then move forward with just the wife. But I would definitely extend it to the husband as well and try to encourage a tour with both of them. Mm -hmm. And in that pre-work, identify what are those specific things that they're most interested in okay. as it relates to the organization to ensure they have that experience during their tour. Okay. And that way you get the buy-in from both of them. And then you're you're carrying them through the uh, cost selling cycle simultaneously. And they move together in preparation for your presentation for the ask. Mm -hmm. You know, in your experience, do you find that the women lead the, um, the decisions about who a family is going to invest in? Um, or so, do you have a sense of that? I mean, I know that's kind of like a, a generalization, but I'm just curious, like what you see. So from a traditional standpoint, women tend to be more philanthropic in terms of the engagement level. Mm -hmm. And then the men um, or the head of the household tends to be the one to kind of support with writing that for that check. But in today's society, things have evolved tremendously. And so with that, you know, the scope of the relationship may be tremendously different. So as fundraising professionals, we don't want to make any assumptions. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that we ask all of the pertinent questions during the need discovery phase to ensure sure that we are in fact um, adhering to what it is that they like to experience and then we're also honoring the relationship whatever you know the roles may be so we ask for clarification at the beginning of developing this relationship as opposed to once you're getting to the point where you're ready to make the ask and then you have to double back and say oh should we include your husband or making the ask with one uh, of the parties and then they say, you know, I'd like to, and I'll consider this, but I still, I need to speak with my spouse or partner. Mm -hmm. So you want to ask those questions um, at the beginning of the relationship to ensure that you um, have covered your bases. Okay. So let me push in a little deeper on that. Um, you have, let's say the wife comes for Shannon's tour and she loves it. And she's like, yeah, I think, you know, 
LaShonda, we're going to make a gift and I just need to chat with my, my husband about this. Do you push and say, well, may I follow up with you in a week or do, how do you navigate that next step? Or do you just, are you just like, great, let me know what, what you want to do if you want more information. Like how, how hard do you push it forward is like, it's not. So really I definitely would ask subsequent questions because she's really interested. You know, what okay. are the areas that you're most interested in supporting? What type of impact would you like to make? You know, ha is your husband familiar with this organization? What type of impact would he like to make? So that when you are thinking about the presentation that you'll pull together, that it's reflective of not only the areas of interest, but you also want to make sure that your ask um, amount will align with the type of impact that they'd like to make. And then you also want to follow up with, you know, thank you for sharing all of this information. I would love to do some additional research to ensure that when we come back together, that we're able to um, go into or dive deeper into our conversation so that I can get some quantifiables that align with the impact that you're trying to make. And can I schedule a subsequent meeting or I'll check back with you? to identify a time where I can meet with both of you to go over what it is that your desired impact may be and that financial implication of that impact. I love that. I love the financial implication. I love that phrase. That's a, that's a great phrase because it really, it is an impact that goes beyond just what we might think We're writing the check. Exactly. It because takes I might, you know, Exactly. And then in addition to that, you know, my thought process for my gift may be that I want to do X, Y, and Z, and I think it only will cost a, a million dollars. In fact, it may be a million five. So okay. you need to make sure that, again, that it aligns and that way you get clarification and you can provide um, the prospective donor with all the pertinent information so that they can make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. I love it. Thank you. You know, this next question that comes to us from Zach in Rochester is um, a question we're getting more and more. I think as um, you know, the pandemic has shifted and people are now doing more physical things together. Um, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Zach writes, could you give me your opinion on offering swag to our visiting donors and potential donors? Some on our team think it is critical for visiting donors to not leave empty handed. Others, like me, think it is a waste of money and resources. I mean, I go on a lot of tours. I go to, I visit a lot of nonprofits, not just in my community, all over. And I will witness to you that I'm, it seems like, you know, you get a lot of things. Very rarely do you use it. And that's exactly where I was going. Meaningful swag. OK, yeah. branding is everything. And yeah, so branding. if you're going to invest in resources as it relates to swag, you want to have um, tangibles that are branded and that also are practical and things that your prospective donors and donors would use. Mm -hmm. And so I love pens because I'm writing every day and that's a reminder I love little notepads because we're always scribbling notes. Um, thinking about things that individuals use all the time. You know, I work at a law school mm -hmm. and at the law school, uh, many of our uh, alumni attorneys are flying here. They're flying there. They're handling cases. So for me, having travel accessories is really important because it reminds them, you know, if I'm journeying somewhere, if I'm going to the courtroom, I've got some kind of tag on my bag. I'm thinking about my alma mater. If I'm traveling out of town, I'm thinking about my alma mater. It's a, a part of the practicality of your daily life. So thinking about things that are practical, that uh, align with your organization, that are also things that will be a part of someone's day-to-day -day life. So you have to be very strategic with it um, because why can be very expensive and so, yeah. you know, sometimes people get, you know, they get campaign specific swag and right. it's great for a specific time frame. But think of things that are meaningful, again, that can be evergreen. That's right. the new word, evergreen. Things that are essential, that are evergreen, that people will use. Think about who is your target audience and what are the things that are practical for them. Mm -hmm. And I know I used to get a lot of keychains and keychains, in my opinion, are not the thing to give away. <laughs> no, I mean, it. you know, it's interesting. I think there's more value and I would love your feedback on this. I think there's more value in a t-shirt. 
it seems to me like people like, wow, t-shirt, you know, and I don't know if it's because they, they assign more value to it, like that it's more expensive. Um, but I, I'm amazed at when you, when you see t-shirts being given away from, from like, you know, a, a sports event where they're throwing, pitching them into the stadium or the, the crowd to, um, especially volunteer things. I think that's powerful. Um, t-shirts can be very powerful because it, it re-emphasizes your organization's brand. Yeah. I've done t-shirts before as incentives, um, with one of my past employers, it does at time get a little complicated when you're using them as incentivized giving, because then you have to go into the specs of t-shirt sizes and yeah. what quantity to order. So if there are yeah. things that you're keeping on hand and, you know, it's, I just so happen to have them to give away. Great. But if you're going to go for a specific um, campaign, it can get complex. So you want to be very mindful of sizes. And I, I, in many instances, we we'll revert to the size large as our oh, yeah. general size large and extra large yeah. in hopes that it would not be offensive and just letting them know we have limited quantity and sizes um, because of, you know, today's traditional society in size. Yeah, I would say skew to the larger because people will generally wear something large, but not something that's too tight. So exactly. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, I think, on that. But for me, that's that's definitely what I think. OK, let's go to Kathleen, again, city withheld. Um, I'll woman up and say I took this person's city off. Um, the question is, we are planning a cultivation event for major donors with a high net worth. We have some on our team who think we should do this at our shelter and others who believe we should choose a more upscale, swanky location. Can you help us determine which course to take? This is like <laughs> a fascinating question. I love this question. And I love this question too, because I, well, how do I say this? I love the organizational experience. And, Me you know, too. We were at AFP and that's what we talked a lot about with storytelling. And a part of that is that experience. And, you know, although they may be high net worth donors, they know that your organization is a shelter and them having the experience and being able to see the types of services that you provide firsthand. And then also seeing how they can make a gift to amplify the services having them to experience it and, and, and witness it in real time and say, well, these are some other things that I think would add to the dynamic work that you're already doing is far more powerful. Now, if you want to do a swanky event later to celebrate the, um, the actual uh, new facility, great. But in real time, as you are cultivating that relationship, let them have that experience because that is powerful. They go to swanky places all the time if they're high net worth yeah. individuals. And it's those exactly. simple things that will resonate with them the most. You know, that's ex that was my first thought. I'm like, first of all, these people are already going to swanky places. Been there, done that, right? They, more than once. They know them all. And they know what things cost. Exactly. So and you like, want to be a good steward of resources. Yeah. It's like, why would you be spending money on this when we know you need a new oven, beds. Or you need more beds or you need more, you know, staff? I mean, I just think this is such a misguided um, approach. It's almost like LaShonda and I'm getting like totally on my, you know, soapbox here. But it's almost like those galas in the event that we got to liquor these people up before we start the auction. <laughs> I mean, you know what that I'm talking awesome. about, friend. You know, right? It's yeah. a horrible attitude. It's a horrible. It, it horrible is. Attitude. You know, and I'm a fan of mocktails. Tone mm -hmm. it down and have mocktails. I've We've had some really phenomenal events and had mocktails, which creates an opportunity um, to be cost effective and also to promote sobriety. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's OK. And you, the last thing you want is individuals attending your event and with these open bars and potentially um, having an accident. And so, yeah. And I'm going back to the question. Less is more and allow the prospective donor to have that experience, yeah. to be able to engage authentically, and most importantly, to share their opinion about their visit and what resonated with them most. 
And most importantly, on top of that is how they want to be a further service to help your organization grow. Yeah, And they can't do that at the swanky place. Well, I, I think you said something very magical. And I think it, for me, it's, it's really powerful because, you know, you drive down and you're, you know, crazy expensive car and you're dressed in designer clothes and then you know what these things cost you know the investments that you've made to live a certain way and have certain things and then you go through especially a shelter and right. you you can just say oh my god one car payment would do this or exactly this, this designer suit would have fed this many people or whatever you don't get that when you're at the swanky event i mean you just don't right you and, and you so, can't put enough pop presentation slides up to convey that. Yeah, exactly. It's a visceral thing. So Kathleen, man, I'm sure you're like, wow, I'm never going to ask a question of that. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, okay, this is something that um, I want to spend some time with. Um, we, if you joined us in the green room chatter, um, this came up and it's really a, a deep conversation um, in fact, we have the president or the CEO of AFP coming on the show um, in just a couple of weeks, Mike Geiger, to be talking about what's going on with AFP. Um, I just attended AFP Icon Conference in Toronto. I came back to my nonprofit fired up and filled with new ideas. The problem is not a lot of other staff seem at all interested in some of my new thoughts. How do I manage this? <laughs> And bummed in Baltimore, they signed it. Bummed, you know, yeah. <laughs> I I think this is this is not just icon. This is if you are doing, if you're going to the plumber's convention and you come back and you're all fired up about a new tool or a new process, right? How do you share this excitement? And so talk to us. You were at AFP Icon with your team from Fundraising Academy. What happened? So first and foremost, maintain your enthusiasm because enthusiasm is infectious. So do not curb your enthusiasm from anyone. And anyone who has had the opportunity to attend AFP ICON would know that this is a place where you are amplified, you are inspired. It is truly the mecca of resources for fundraising professionals. No matter what particular role you may have within your organization, you can learn from the back uh, office all the way to the front office and then how to transition in between. Um, like this particular person from Baltimore, I am amplified. There's all these things that you want to do. And first, what I'd suggest is prior to going to conferences, take a moment to speak with your team members, let them know that you're attending, and then allow them the opportunity to peruse the conference schedule and the various options uh, as far as topics are concerned. And ask them, you know, to let you know if there's one or two sessions that are most important to you. And I love ICON because they make the presentation slides available to you. So in the event that in my particular role and I wanted to see something else, I can still download those slides to share with my colleague. That's mm -hmm. one way to attempt to get buy-in on the front end. Mm -hmm. You also will need buy-in from leadership. And apparently there is some buy-in from leadership because you're going. But the <laughs> most important part is when you come back. When you come back, are you given the platform or the opportunity to share with the team some of the things that you um, have deemed to be very, very relative to your role? And then based on that pre-conversation that are relative to those individuals' roles. That's one particular way to try to identify uh, a way to encourage and inspire those particular individuals. And I think that that may work best, um, just like you cultivate your donors and asking them those questions as it relates to need discovery. Do the same thing with your colleagues. What are some areas that you'd like to know more about? Let's look and see if that's covered in the schedule to get their buy-in. And hopefully they'll share some things that they'd like to learn. And then when you come back and share that information with them, it creates a very collegial environment. They're open, they're receptive, and you've got the leadership, you've got the platform to give an overview of how all of these sessions can help um, elevate your, your team and help align with you achieving your goals. Mm -hmm. And that I think will help culminate and create a buzz and enthusiasm for when anyone attends a conference, whether it's AFP ICON or a local conference. Yeah, and we're going to be talking about uh, the conference that you all at Fundraising Academy have in just a moment. But, you know, I think this is such an interesting question because I also think that 
and and we talked about this in the green room chatter. I mean, realistically, there have been a lot of conferences that have been canceled. And this this is kind of like we're getting back. We're getting back in the swing of doing these things. And conference management and conference services have changed dramatically about how we do things. But at, at the core of it, we are a social people, right? And to Definitely. meet somebody that maybe we've been engaging with online. I mean, I feel like you're my blood sister. I know you. We have never physically met. I have right. no idea how tall you are. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Exactly. It's, right. It's really interesting. It's really, and you know, you only know the color of my skin on how it looks on camera. I think it looks very different when I'm not lit, right? Okay. You know what I mean? It's right. Like, All of the dynamics, right? Things, yeah. And yeah. so then when you have that opportunity, um, I think it's really profound. And, and talk to us. You actually got to do that, right? You met with yes. somebody. Yeah. Talk, share that with us because it's an interesting thing. So I, um, I have created um, a CFRE study group. Uh, Brie, my girl, she started it. Um, it was a part of Jack Alato's study group. We had a sub study group of women and we decided that we wanted to, you know, be together throughout the week and study for the CFRE process. Um, long story short, there were about eight to 10 of us that were a constant community of practice. And so we literally post passing the CFRE, we maintain communication. We would have monthly Zooms to check in with one another. We literally did online presentations together. We do some hybrid presentations where a couple of us would be in person and a couple of us would join online. And I was so excited to meet in person for the very first time, my girl, Heather Butler in um, at AFP Icon. She lives in New Finland and we've been in touch for two years in this virtual space. And so needless to say, the hugs that we were able to share upon actually laying eyes on each other in real time, I probably hugged her so much so that she was out of breath, okay? <laughs> and so it is that personal connection that you're able to make in person that really makes a phenomenal difference in relationships. And, you know, that face-to-face -face time is priceless and it's truly an investment um, in fostering a relationship in a, in a more deep way. And it also creates the opportunity for so much more creativity. Right. Um, and she, yeah. she was so kind. She brought me a new Finland gift baggie, like full oh. of snacks and treats. And she had her uh, mom to make me some hand knit little foot booties. I mean, <laughs> I was just, I literally was brought to tears, you know, yeah, and, and that cool. experience of meeting her face to face for the first time is similar to what we talked about with having donors have experiences within those particular organizations and being able to say, oh, wow, this is an amazing experience. I want to have it again. And right. so absolutely, there's nothing like a face to face conference. Well, there, you know, it, it, you're right. And, and it's the human contact. And I think that, you know, that you're talking about this in a professional um, environment with your colleagues in your sector, um, just like we talk about this with our donors. And you mentioned that earlier. I mean, it is that it's that piece of the relationship and, and how we steward things. Um, let's talk about Cultivate because you all sold out. And it is, it's just really exciting, but it's also a bummer because it's for so many people that want to be able to get, a, you know, in and learn and gather from Cultivate, they're going to have to wait until next year and they're going to have to jump in sooner. So talk to us about this because I hear there's a, a mystery waiting list. So we are enthusiastic that Cultivate Year 2 uh, was sold out relatively quickly because yeah. uh, Year 1 was last year and we had some amazing sessions and we had individuals to participate from a variety of different places and spaces and listening to their feedback. We increased the, the conference dates to a day and a half, which is phenomenal. Uh, we have a very diverse lineup of presenters, of topics. We have three tracks. 
And yes, there's a, a wait list uh, for those of you that are interested in getting on the wait list. Uh, we do realize that it is definitely in demand, but we also may be teasing some additional things in the days ahead. I'm not going to be the spoiler alert, but do stay tuned on um, your social media devices uh, because we do have some additional announcements forthcoming. So definitely you want to follow the Fundraising Academy on LinkedIn and uh, on our Facebook and social media platforms. Okay. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So even I'm like, I'm like really looking forward to this. Well, um, we, the nonprofit show will be there. We'll be doing a live remote broadcast on Friday. Um, and we will have um, Meredith Terrian from your team there I'm doing that live remote along with Wendy Adams, also one of our co-hosts. I'm going to be speaking at an event in Boston, so I'll be on the other side of the country. Um, but I will tune in to watch and see, you know, what happens. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's really exciting that um, for me, it's it's just so thrilling to see that our sector is willing to make these investments and to learn more about this, like to, to improve themselves so that they can bring more money to their nonprofits. I mean, when I when I look back, when I step back and I look at this, that's the message that I get, Lashonda, right? Oh, definitely. And you know, yeah. when we're there, we're cultivating knowledge, impact, and relationships. And I've been to many conferences, and I love the fact that our conference still provides that intimate opportunity because our classroom sizes aren't as huge, but in the same vein, it's also very cost effective. So no matter what size your organization is, it would reach anyone's budget. So we've uh, been very intentional with looking at what some of the major trends are and what the market demands as far as content and what people want to know more about. And then also, you know, having a call for sessions that's reflective of those demands to ensure that when individuals decide to invest in coming to the physical conference, that they have a unique experience that is not only empowering, but they're leaving with tools that they can use and they have time to also network with individuals so that they can create their own community of practice. Right. Which I love. I think that's just like so important. Well, as always, LaShonda Williams, MPA, CFRE, one of the brilliant trainers with our friends over at Fundraising Academy at National University. Um, I always love your perspective and I, I love your energy. And I just think you're such a um, a leader in how we should behave and embrace this hard work. And um, so thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us. Uh, yet again, it, it's a good Friday for me when I see your name on the list. And it's a great Friday for me whenever I have a chance to have a chat with you. <laughs> well, thank you. Hey, we have a lot of wonderful presenting sponsors, and they include Bloomerine, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that make you know, a, a huge investment with us mentally, physically, financially. And um, as we are now in our fifth year of broadcasting, it's really, really powerful. You know, LaShonda, when we started this more than a thousand shows again ago, and we started this journey that literally now has put us in our fifth year, we crafted a sign off. Um, and at the time I was saying it for myself, to be honest, because I, I just saw, you know, a lot of, you know, struggle like we all did because of the pandemic and um, the message changes and, and it's still a relevant message. And so I remind everyone to stay well so you can do well. All right, my friend, we will see you soon. Mm -hmm.